Good morning. I'd like to welcome you back to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. And we're starting a new week. And so I am, again, very excited about the text of Scripture that we will deal with. Uh, it's a very familiar passage of Scripture. And so if you joined us on Sunday, you will uh, understand exactly where we're going with this um, study. But we are in Luke chapter 5 again. And we're looking at verses 57 through 62. And we're actually going to finish out uh, this chapter of Luke this week. Here's what it says. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But go thou, preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid farewell to them which are at my house. Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now the passage that we're looking at has a lot of important themes for us to digest. And the first of those themes is the one that we're going to deal with this morning. And that is the fact that we need to face the identity of Christ. And if you look back at verse 57, he says this, Luke writes, it came to pass as they went in the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. There is a context that drives us to see this statement being made. The question we should all ask ourselves is why is it that a man will come up to Jesus and say, I'm willing to follow you wherever you go. What is going on in this man's heart that's leading him to that kind of a convictional statement? Well, the answer is that he has seen several compelling reasons to believe that Jesus is the Christ and to believe that he is the one who should be followed. Well, you say, well, well what is it that was compelling this man to do that? Well, when we read through the Gospels, we see volumes of information that's pointing us to this compelling case that Jesus is the Messiah. I think about how it ends in John uh, chapter 20 where Jesus uh, is, is standing before Thomas and he says, you know, touch my hands, touch my, my side and see the nail prints. And Thomas says, behold, my Lord and my God, I believe that you are the Messiah who has risen from the dead. Well, as John's writing the end of that book, it says many other things truly to Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That by believing, you might have life through his name. John's basically saying, all these things that I've recorded for you, they are proofs that drive you to the point that you recognize Christ is Messiah and you need to believe on him. Well, let me give you a couple of examples. I'm just going to hit two of them, but there's actually lots and lots of examples of Jesus actually claiming to be God in flesh. And the way that he did it wasn't just saying, hey, I'm standing before you as God. That's not what he did. Instead, what he did is he made statements where he did things that only God can do, or that were specifically statements about God made in the Old Testament in prophetic texts. The first example is actually at the beginning of his public ministry in Nazareth. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as it was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood to read. Then he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind. And then as Jesus works his way through that text that he's reading, it says that he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he sat down, and the eyes of them all were fastened on him, and they began to say unto him, what is going on? And he says, well, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your midst. What is Jesus doing? Well, he's referring to Isaiah 60 and 61, and he's saying that what this text is saying is going to happen in the future is actually happening right now in its fulfillment in front of you. And the person that's talking in Isaiah 60 and 61 is God himself. So Jesus is claiming by saying that these scriptures are fulfilled today, right in front of you. He's saying, I'm the Messiah. I'm God in flesh. You need to accept me. And we see later on in verse 28 
that the people in the synagogue understood exactly what Jesus was claiming. Because it says, all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. They were angry because they said, we know Jesus. He's just a boy that grew up in Nazareth. He cannot be God in flesh. Or another example is in John chapter 8, where it says, Jesus said, I therefore say unto you, you shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he. You shall die in your sins. And they said unto him, who art thou? Jesus said, even the same I said unto you from the beginning. And then later on in verse 40, it says, now you seek to kill me, a man that you told, that told you the truth, which I've heard from God. This did not Abraham. Verse 58, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him and to kill him. Now, again, this is another example of Jesus referring to himself according to some of the Old Testament passages that are prophetic in nature and talking about God speaking. And so when he says, before Abraham was, I am, he's saying, I, I am independent of time. He's putting himself in the category of the creator and the sustainer, someone who is eternal, has no beginning and no end. And so when Jesus made these statements, the people that were there, they said, we understand what you're saying. You're saying you're God in flesh. So one of the reasons that this man was so willing to go and to follow Christ is because of Jesus' own words from himself. But also the miracles that Jesus performed left this undeniable witness. John 3, 2. Think about what Nicodemus said. He said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles except God be with him. An example of one of the miracles that uh, Nicodemus could have very easily been referencing is in Mark chapter 2, verse 5. It says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto them, and the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. There were certain of the scribes sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, saying, Why did this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God? And then Jesus goes on to say, Which is easier, to tell the sick of the palsy, Rise up and walk? Or to say, thy sins are forgiven. And he says, so that you will know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I tell you, rise up, take up your bed, and you walk. Now, now what's the point? The point is that Jesus was, was, was not just saying, I am Messiah, God in flesh. But he was giving evidence of it through the miracles that he performed. Also, by the way, he taught. In Matthew chapter 7, it says this, it came to pass that when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You say, well, what does it mean he taught as one having authority? Well, we see in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, this statement, you have heard it said of old, but I say unto thee. Jesus is establishing himself as authoritative in a way that the scribes and the Pharisees were not. Five times, actually six times, in that text of scripture, in that five through seven section, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes that statement. The reason is because he is God. So you, you might say, well, well, Joel, what, what is the takeaway from this? Well, here's the simple takeaway. You can't be neutral about Christ. If somebody says that they're God, then you can't say, well, they're not God, but they're a good man. Or if somebody says, I have the power to forgive sins, or I have the power to raise the dead, but they don't have that power. You can't say, well, Okay, they were a little off on this area, but they're still a good man, a good teacher. They had a lot of good things to say. We have to face these claims. They are objective. They are, they are, they are claims that are strong. They're, we can't just run away from them. We have to face them. And so either he is truly the Son of God and fulfills all these Old Testament prophecies, or he's a liar. And all these people that died as martyrs, well, they, they died in vain. They died for a lie. We'd have to make a conclusion on one side or the other. And so my encouragement to you this, this morning is to ask the question, have you come face to face with the reality of who Jesus is? Have, have you recognized you can't be neutral about him? Have you embraced him as the Messiah who died for your sins, who rose from the dead, and you can be declared righteous and forgiven in him? If you haven't trusted Christ, I hope that this morning you will think critically about what the Bible says about Christ, that you will turn to him with a repentant heart and place your faith in Christ. If this has been a challenge to you, please take a moment to share that. If you think it would be encouragement to someone else, please take a moment to share it with them. And Lord willing, tomorrow we'll continue our study. Bye now.